Who is Ahithophel? A portrait of bitterness. So we can all be examples for God, even if we are a bad example, right? And the story of Ahithophel is, an example, is a bad example. So there's a purpose for that. God put in the Bible even bad examples. And not many Christians know who Ahithophel is. Uh, could you pronounce it with me? Ahithophel. Ahithophel. And uh, I should ask this group, how many have not heard of Ahithophel before now? Have not heard? Okay, there's a few. All right. And um, we're going to cover, we're going to go through his story. There are not many references to Ahithophel. We'll cover the few that are there and, and gain a, a, a message, a, a, a lesson for us today. But before we do, and it's, it's uh, concerning bitterness, let, let me read the text again. See that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. I will present this in a different way. Generally or typically, a sermon starts off with a, with a cause of this type, with a cause and then the consequences and then the cure. I will reverse the order. I will start with the cure, then the consequences, and then the cause. That way, if you stay awake with me, the first uh, 10, 15 minutes, you will have the message. You will have the heart of the message. And what you do with the balance of the time is, is up to you. So, the Christian experience is one, is uh, not a smooth road. It's a, it's a road of, well, testing. God will and does test us. There's purpose. There's a, there's a reason, there's purpose behind that. There's a reason why God, the, those, his children whom he loves, he he will, he will pass them through tests. The Israelites, an example in the Old Testament are the Israelites. They, they went through testing. We find that in Deuteronomy 8, verses 2 and 3. And you shall remember the way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The Israelites were tested through the wilderness. They were tested with thirst in bitter waters. I'd like to... Before getting into the story of Ahithophel, I'd like to give you a short story in the, the experience of the Israelites when they left Egypt. And that is found in Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 to 25. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Mara, which in Hebrew means bitterness, they could not drink the water of Mara because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. And the people grumbled or murmured, complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log or tree, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. So this, they had crossed the Red Sea and were on their way to Mount Sinai. But for a period of three days, they had no water. If you've ever been thirsty even for a day, you know how miserable that can be. Can you imagine three days without water? They were thirsty to the point of panicking. And there was a, there was a, the, a cry, those up, up, up front, they found water. And, and, they, they, and Moses knew the area. He, he, he didn't even have time to warm them. That water was bitter. 
That was undrinkable water. And they, they ran before he could even tell them. They ran to, that, to, to drink of that water. And there was a cry that Ellen Chihuahua talks about. There was a, uh, 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 an outcry. Ah, oh, awful tasting water. They couldn't drink it. Undrinkable water. There was nothing they could do about it. What can you do with this water? And they complained to Moses. They murmured. They were bitter. They were upset. You, you take us out here, what, to, to die. And it says here that uh, Moses cried out to the Lord. The Lord showed him a log or a tree and he th to throw it into the water, and the water became sweet. So we'll start out with a working definition of bitterness. This is what we'll uh, proceed with. Bitterness is an unresolved violation of our justice system. God or someone has wronged us, and we see an injustice committed that we cannot resolve. We want to lash out, but we cannot, or are constrained to do so, and we become bitter. So we have a, a sense of justice, of fairness, and it's been violated, and we, we can't strike back. We can't resolve it. And... We internalize it. We become bitter. I have to make a distinction here between our justice system and God's. Society's justice system focuses on fairness and equality. So equal pay, equal education, equal job opportunities, equality of medical advances, everything equal, equal, equal. That's not the way God sees justice. God's focus on justice it focuses on justice over fairness. And there are many examples in Scripture. Let me give you a couple and, and maybe discuss these a little bit. So, in the, in, in the giving of the inheritance, handing out the inheritance, the firstborn was to receive a double portion over the other brothers. This is found in the, in this, in the various stories of the patriarchs and the like. Is that fair? No, that's not fair. Why, why should he receive double portion? But is it just? It is just. Why? He's in control of the whole family later on. Yes, indeed. He's, he's, in, he's been made in charge, so he's responsible for the caring of his aging parents. He's responsible for, uh, you might say, settling the estate. He's responsible for, for daughters, his, his sisters that may not st still be unmarried and he may have to take care of them. So he had, he had duties, he had responsibilities. It is just. He should receive more so he can carry out the responsibilities that he's to take on. In terms of uh, a stealing or thievery, so uh, a thief, a robber, steals one ox. According to the law, he should pay back five oxen. Five. One for five. That's, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. Shouldn't it be... There's no equality there. There's five to one. In terms of sheep, if you stole one sheep, you'd have, you have to pay back four. That's not fair. But is it just? Okay. So there's, there's a penalty portion. Yes, there's a punitive aspect to justice, right? It's, it's not just an, an equal uh, inequality, but there's a punitive aspect to, to justice. And then the other aspect is our focus. Our focus is narrow, and, and God's focus is on eternity. So his, his time frame and perspective is... Is, is eternity, ours is narrow. So we might see the situation for what is happening at the moment. But God sees the end from the beginning and he knows better. Our view is tainted. Our, our, our view is selfish. God's is righteous. So there's, there's, uh, we have to accept God's way of doing things in, in our lives 
uh, at times without uh, really at the moment understanding his, his purposes. Bitterness can be directed vertically or horizontally toward God alone. It, you, you might be bitter for what maybe how he's made you. Maybe, you know, God gave me parents that uh, with issues, you know, parents that maybe were drunk or had uh, drug issues, problems, and, and you might have inherited those. And, and you're, so you're bitter toward God for giving you parents, the parents he gave you or for maybe not giving you parents. You know, you might be an orphan, or um, you might be bitter towards God. For, there are many, many reasons uh, one can be bitter towards God. You might be bitter toward, horizontally, to, toward, toward a, a fellow human being, for legitimate or not legitimate reasons. There's, there's so many. Uh, one example that I've heard is, uh, is a, a brother a young man who saw his father slap his, his brother. And he was upset at his father for slapping his brother. He, he didn't think it was, uh, it was right. And he was upset at, upset at his brother for, for not being bitter at his, or upset at his father. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a misdirected uh, sense of uh, bitterness and, and injustice. All right, we're, we're, we've come to the cure. So here, here comes the cure. And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log or a tree. And he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. The solution is a tree. Simple as that. Okay, so we need to, we need to cover this a little bit. What, 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 is the, what, is the, what is the message behind this? What does the tree symbolize? Trees in the Bible... There's, I'll give you a, a few examples here. Trees in the, in the Garden of Eden were for, for man's blessing. Trees produced fruit. We were, the Adam and Eve were teed of the fruit-bearing fruit, uh, fruit trees. And there was the tree of life. Of course, there also was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Christ was crucified on a, on a tree. There is the tree of life in the New Testament. Twelve kinds of fruit, leaves, for the healing of the nations. And there's a tree reference of a of tree or the use of a tree in the, in the sanctuary. Uh, let's uh, go into that one a little bit. It was the acacia tree. I, I thought I'd, I'd study this a little bit. It's an interesting tree. I don't know if, you've, if this group has gone over the, uh, the different attributes or qualities this tree has. It has yellow blossoms. It has thorns. It's a thorny tree. Its bark is reddish. In fact, uh, well, that, uh, there are a number of varieties, but the one that they believe it is the one mentioned in the Bible is the acacia seyal, or the red acacia. It's, it has a reddish bark. Is it? Okay. Yes, the, it's a, yes uh, the pods are... Okay. Uh, this is an, another set of photos showing the, the reddish bark that it has. And when it's, uh, when it's injured or when it's cut, it, it, uh, this, the, this, the sap that comes out, is the gum is, is used commercially. And, and it has a number of uses. It, it's uh, cosmetic and, and medicinal has a cosmetic medicinal quality. It's even used for thickening in, in uh, food, foods. So this, is, uh, this tree is, is uh, used in the sanctuary, in, in the furniture of the, the altar burnt offering. It's used in, inside the holy place. So, so what's interesting about this red, reddish bark is it's covered by reddish uh, metal in the in the altar of burnt offering and it's covered by bronze yes and it's covered by gold in the holy and most holy places so it's, a, it's an apt symbol of Christ red representing of course Christ's shedding of his blood so a tree 
So what does a tree symbolize? And I'd like to uh, read for you Luke 6, verses 27 to 28. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. I went through an experience of bitterness uh, about 10 years ago. Someone d did me wrong, and it, it was someone in the church, and I could not get, and, and I, it, it, was, it was so bad I had to, uh, our family had to leave this church and, and, and transfer to another church. Um, I was, I became bitter because there was, well, I just, I was so upset and I, I couldn't get over it for, and, and this went on for a year. It interfered with my prayer life. It interfered with my just attitude about different things and I just couldn't get over it until I came across a little book and it was the last chapter of that book that, that gave me the solution. The solution was right out of scripture, right out of the words of Jesus. Pray for those, what, what it says here, this verse here, but I say unto you, who, I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who abuse you. So the, this, this chapter recommended praying for this individual. Now this is how I prayed. Father, this person needs you. This person needs to understand what he's done. He needs to give him of your grace, give him of your, uh, an, an understanding heart. And, 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 and repent, and change, and, 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 because uh, you, I want him to be in, in your kingdom, because I, I felt that this person was, was lost because of what he had done, and whenever this bitterness would come, I would pray, and I, and I continued, this would be day after day, week after week, it took about three months, for me to finally, it, it cleared up, and it cleared up completely. So that's a solution. The solution is when, 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 when you're bitter towards God, you pray and praise God. God, you know, you know what's right for me. I praise you for your love, for your power, because I know you're, you're, you, see, you have my best in mind. When it's an enemy, you pray for their salvation. Father, be with them. Bless them. You pray a blessing. You pray, you, you, wherever you see that you can do good, you do good. You love your enemies. That's the solution. All right. Now we're going, we'll get into the consequences of bitterness. And this is the story of Ahithophel. Who is Ahithophel? Right up front, I'll tell you. And then we'll go into details on, on, in his life. Now in those days, this is 2 Samuel ver, chapter 16, verse 23. Now in those days, the counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. So was all the counsel of, of Ahithophel esteemed, both by David and by Absalom. Ahithophel was a, was a counselor, so great a counselor, that it, it, it was as if you had consulted God himself. That's amazing to, to, be, to, to have that kind of reputation. But as we learn, as we will learn in the story, he sided with Absalom. Now we know from, from, the, from the story uh, of David and, and, and his son Absalom that Absalom was a bitter man for good reason. So we should, we should go into uh, his background a bit. David was at the height of his reign. He had, for the most part, conquered his enemies. There was a skirmish uh, going on that his, that his general was conducting, and he decided to stay at home. Big mistake. And while at home, he, he was tempted to, to commit adultery. He, he, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And to cover up the sin, he, uh, he, he had his, his uh, Bathsheba's husband put to death. And, and God judged him 
um, and he repented, and yet, yet his, the, the, the consequences would follow. And he lost the son, that, uh, the first son of, of Bath, from Bathsheba. Then another son committed rape with his half-sister, half and, and it, was, it was Absalom's full sister. Absalom plotted and, and ultimately killed his, his half-brother, and he had to flee. David, after I believe a period of a year or so, uh, was, was encouraged, was admonished to call him back. Yet Absalom continued to be, he was upset, he was bitter toward his father David for not taking action toward this, uh, this evil that was done to his half-sister. And Absalom plotted against David. Absalom sought to take over the kingdom. So this is the background when we get to Absalom. Let's, let's follow the story in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 7 through 10. And at the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, Please let me go and pay my vow, which I vowed to the Lord in Hebron. For your servant vowed a vow while I lived in Geshur in Aram, saying, If the Lord will indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will offer worship to the Lord. The king said to him, Go in peace. So he rose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king of Hebron. Continuing with verses 11 and 12. With Absalom went 200 men from Jerusalem who were invited guests, and they went in their innocence and knew nothing. And while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor from his city, Gilo. And the conspiracy grew great, it grew strong, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. So we encounter this, this mighty counselor, this, this uh, important man taking sides with Absalom. He too was bitter, and we'll, we'll, we'll see this, we'll understand this uh, later on, why he, was, why he was bitter. On hearing this, a messenger came to David. On hearing this, David had to flee. And uh, he fled Jerusalem, and he fled in a hurry. He, he says, it says he went barefooted up, was climbing up, uh, ascending Mount of Olives. Let's, let's read that passage. Second Samuel chapter 15, verses 30 and 31. But David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot and with his head covered. And all the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up, weeping as they went. And it was told, David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, Oh, Lord, please the, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. So you, you have to visualize this or uh, appreciate this. David is fleeing for his life. And then comes a messenger and tells him. And it's, it's like he cringes. Oh, no, please don't tell me. Don't. Oh, don't tell me. Yes, it's true. Ahithophel is sided with David. He feared what he feared came to pass. Ahithophel, the, my, um, the mighty counselor, had sided with the enemy. On the way, uh, in the ascent to Mount, Mount, uh, the Mount of Olives, he, he, uh, he is met with Hushai. And, and we won't go into that, uh, the, the, the story there, but he meets Hushai, who is also a counselor, a faithful counselor to David. And to go to flee together with him. And David says, no, I want you to go back and to join Absalom and to be, you might say, a spy and to help defeat the council of Ahithophel, which he did. So, Hushai meets uh, David near the summit and, and now 
Absalom with his with his army arrives in Jerusalem and takes the city with without a without a, a, any uh, resistance whatsoever. So what's the first? So he arrives in, Absalom arrives in the city and says, "Okay, what do I do now? There's no no battle. I've taken over the city." And he asks Ahithophel, "What should I do next?" And Ahithophel advises him to do something horrible, evil, totally evil. And that evil was that he should take the, uh, David, David left behind his concubines, to take the concubines and, 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 and commit immoral, uh, an immoral act with them on the roof of the palace. This was to fulfill a prophecy which we find in Second Samuel chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he, will, and he shall lie with your wives and in the sight of this son, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Ahithophel was so bent on the destruction of David, he was so bitter toward David that he, he came up with this scheme, this evil scheme to destroy David's reputation and to seal, you might call it, there was no turning back at this point. Absalom had to move forward with his, his rebellion. There was no turning back. So what's next? So Absalom says, okay, now what do I do? And here's Ahithophel's counsel. Second Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and discouraged and throw him into a panic, and all the people who are with him will flee. I will strike down only the king, and I will bring all the people back to you as a bride comes back to her husband. You seek the life of only one man, and all the people will also will be at peace. Again, you have to picture this, and you'll understand at the end why I believe Ahithophel was uh, an old man. He was an old man, and you have to imagine an old man coming to uh, Absalom and saying, uh, "Let me choose twelve thousand men." And I will arise and pursue David tonight. I'll kill him myself. That's, he was so bitter, so bent on killing David, that this old man was, was, willing to, was ready to do it himself. He was wanting to take on this task and, and do it himself. Who is, this, who is this guy? Why is he so bitter? It's just uh, unbelievable. Bible is not telling us at this point yet. Now, it must have been so uh, odd for, for Absalom to hear this that he must have been taken aback. He says, whoa, old man, hold back. Take it easy. I mean, I, I'm, I'm bitter, but you're, like, you're, you're on, gone the deep end. And he decided to seek the counsel of another counselor. Then, then Absalom it says in 2 Samuel 17, verses 5 through 7, Then Absalom said, Call Hushai the arch archite also, and let us hear what he has to say. And when Hushai came to Absalom, Absalom said to him, Thus has Ahithophel spoken. What shall we do? Shall we do as he says? If not, you speak. This was Hushai's chance. And God, we read in the text, God purposed this to be the case. Then Hushai said to Absalom, This time the counsel of Ahithophel has given is not good. And Hushai gave a counsel that was contrary to Ahithophel's. Now this caused Ahithophel, Ahithophel was wise. This, he was wise in, in, at this point in evil. And he knew that if, if, if this counsel was not heeded, that it would, it would ultimately lead to the defeat of Absalom, which did occur. Absalom ultimately was defeated. Ahithophel realizing this, 
did the following. Second Samuel 17, verse 23. When Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey and went off home to his own city. He set his house in order and hanged himself. And he died and was buried in the tomb of his father. <coughs> this was the end of Ahithophel. His, his uh, bitter, enormously bitter attitude toward David ultimately destroyed himself, destroyed him and his reputation and God's blessing. So why was Ahithophel so bitter? The Bible doesn't tell us directly, but, but we can uh, discern if we read a little bit further. So we come now to the cause. First, we came up with the cure, the consequences of bitterness, ultimately destroying the individual who is bitter, and the cause. We come to the cause. The last reference to Ahithophel is found in 2 Samuel 23, verse 34. And it's a long list of the mighty men David had with him, numerous mighty men that, uh, that uh, associated with David and, and was able to uh, gain victory after victory. One of these we read in 2 Samuel 23, verse 34. Eliphelet, the son of, it, it goes through the list, and, and in verse, this verse it says, Eliphelet, the son of Ahaz, by of Makkah. Then we come to Iliam, the son of Ahithophel of Gilo. So, Ahithophel, Ahithophel's son was one of the mighty men that accompanied David, that uh, won battle after battle with David. Who's Iliam? We have to turn back to 2 Samuel, verse, chapter 11, verse 3. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Iliam was the father of Bathsheba. That makes Ahithophel the grandfather of Bathsheba. So there's a connection here. Ahithophel ex experienced, uh, being in the court of David, experienced David not only shaming his granddaughter, but killing his uh, grandson, grandson. Mm -hmm. grandson. Gran granddaughter and grandson, yes, grandson-in-law, mm -hmm. killing grandson-in-law. All in, in his, you might say, in his presence, this is why he was bitter. Or at least this we can assume is the reason he was bitter. It stemmed from David's failures, chiefly the one directed at his own, at his own family. David had no regard for the well-being of his family to the point that David was willing, he was not above adultery and murder in his own family. That's, that's enough reason. He could not accept, and then to, to, to make it worse, the prophet through the prophet, God forgave him. It must have just blown his mind. It's just, no way, that can't be. That, that's not just, that's not right. Ahithophel rejected God's mercy to David. And ultimately, he rejected God himself. That's why he was so bitter. That's the cause. He would not accept God's mercy for his neighbor. Well, let's, uh, this, there's an epilogue to this story. It doesn't quite end there. You see, David had another son from Bathsheba. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. This young fellow, Solomon, ultimately became king. And it says when he became king in 1 Kings 3, verses 11 and 12, that, that he prayed. He prayed for wisdom. He, God was uh, 
God was offering him、uh, anything he wished. But what he prayed for was wisdom. It says, And God said to him, Solomon, because you have asked this, and I have not asked for your, yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall rise after you. Ahithophel, by not accepting God's justice, well, God's mercy toward David, by not Being reconciled to God by not forgiving, by not blessing his enemies, by not leaving justice to God. He lost out on seeing his grandson, in this case, his great grandson, be,、uh, become even wiser than he through,、uh, because uh, through, through God's、um, granting his request. Ahithophel lost out by not learning the lesson that Jesus would later on uh, uh, teach us that we're to love our enemies, do good to those who hate us, pray for those who mistreat us. And by, and by so doing, we in turn will be blessed. We in turn will receive God's,、uh, God's forgiveness and, and God's grace. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for this lesson. This portrait of bitterness that we learn in the story of Ahithophel. May we learn the lesson that bitterness is, is self destructive, it will do us no good. That we learn what Jesus taught us with regard to our enemies to love them, to pray for them, to do good to them. And by so doing, we, and we will receive of your blessing and of your grace and of your forgiveness. May this be the experience we all have when we confront bitterness. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.